Hello, welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 15. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, good to see you. I'm back in hey, Palo Alto. And, uh, pod good to see you this week, bro. Great, it's been a couple of weeks there, Red Hat Summit. Now I'm back in Palo Alto after, after being in Vegas with Cisco Live, Apple event this week. A lot going on, and uh, episode 15, we're getting the groove. Um, feedback coming in, they like the banter. They like the rant section. So we're going to do that every week we get down the news we're covering. This podcast is just Dave and I riffing and sharing what we're looking at every week, what's on our mind, where we've been with theCUBE and Silicon Angle Media, and then what's our rant for the week where we kind of lay out and bitch and moan about things that are getting under our claw or things that we think is important that may or may not be in the Cube wheelhouse. Um, just so much going on this week, Dave. Apple Vision was launched by Apple, WWDC, the developer conference from Apple. First real big thing since the iPhone, in my opinion, or iPad, some will say. Forbes had an article about Sequoia, the, the best VC firm on the planet, in my opinion, in terms of returns and, and investments, splitting into three companies out of pressure of the scandals around China and India, or China scandals in China and the opportunities in India, I should say. And then the big crypto news is that Binance got uh, found, it got, hit with security laws violations, Coinbase is under, under, under suit as well. And Elon Musk, Twitter sales were cut in half and, and hemorrhaging, they got the new CEO, we've covered that. And then another feature I'm watching that I like is Apple's iWatch has got a new OS, which I'm fascinated, I'd like to get your thoughts on the, what you use for any kind of device. And then uh, a weird story out there that a psychologist, Rachel Cowart says that uh, gaming's good for you. And I said that years ago when my kids were young, Multiplayer gaming will be the future of work. Everyone's got a headset on like you right now and, and do that. And there's a lot of other great stuff going on in, around here. So, and of course my rant this week will be about Mark Andreessen. So if you want to stay tuned for that, he's got, he's got the AI. Not so much a software eating the world article, Dave, but really more of a different kind of rant. Mark Andreessen's kind of lost it, I think. And we're going to get into that rant section. I'll have some data to share there. Um, and then Oracle, Starlink, great lineup. Dave, generative AI continues to rock in the enterprise. Generative AI continues to be the conversation. Will the large language models be the success? All of this on tap, episode 15. Yeah, well, so, and Google made some announcements this week. You know, they, they got into what everybody thought was a panic and they were maybe, you know, people said they were in catch up mode, but um, you know, to your point, generative AI continues to be all the buzz. Although, you know, I think it was there at Cisco Live this week, but it wasn't, you know, front and center. It definitely wasn't the lead, but it was there. But basically the, I think their strategy was sound. It's like, okay, we're going to infuse AI into everything, which I think people have been saying for years. So they don't seem to have been radically changed their strategy as a result of open AI and panicking and saying, this is Cisco saying, oh, we got to do something here that's different. I yeah. think they're basically saying, hey, we've been doing this. Whereas I think Google similarly, uh, or, or somewhat differently said, we got to do something here. There's code red. But, that, but the reality is they were probably already ahead uh, in many respects. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. And now you see all this money flooding into the zone, um, which is always <laughs> fun to see. Well, I think, I think that, I mean, first of all, Google has been ahead. So Google and Amazon on the AI definitely have been ahead. I mean, it's all about machine learning. The large language models came up out, it's been around for a while too, by the way, people don't know that, but chat GPT caused everyone to see the ubiquity of it. Oh, it's magic. So I think that brought mainstream, mainstream uh, you know, computer users to the table, but all the insiders we know have been doing AI for a long time. Google's one of them. Google has so much AI, it's ridiculous how good they are. Now the question is, can they hold on to their engineers or will they flee to join a hot startup? And can they get out of their own way to create good products? We'll see that at uh, Google Next and their event in San Francisco coming up uh, in, in about a month or so. Um, but you know, they're doing some stuff. Google Cloud's making waves. I think there's going to be some announcement with MongoDB coming up, got an event coming up there. You'll see Mongo. Multi-Cloud's going to actually help Google Cloud go from third place up, up, with, up a notch a few maybe. Um, they got to deal with the Mayo Clinic this week for healthcare. Um, they're bringing, you know, the logic and reasoning skills to chatbots and Bard. You mentioned that, so you started to see better improvement there. And they released their secure AI framework to help companies protect 
their AI, AI models from hacking. So, you know, Google's got a treasure trove, Dave, of stuff. And I, I'm telling you right now, Google's its own enemy right now. They, they, they have so much potential. AWS, uh, rightly so, I think has got stronger management relative to kind of competing and executing than Google does. Hence, they're on, on point. They pivoted, I won't say pivoted, bad word. AWS had the machine learning, they had SageMaker, they had all that AI kind of under the covers internal, but quickly moved and generated AI and they have Bedrock, which is their product and they have advantages. And people right now are afraid of their IP leaking, they're afraid of their data. Data will be the intellectual property of the future and it is now seeing that. I think Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud and certainly Azure with OpenAI are going to move to make their environments secure and programmable and agile. So that's going to be the key. It's going to be very, it's going to be a war, Dave. It's going to be who of the hyperscalers will be there. Now, Oracle came out with Starlink this week. Um, and well, wait a minute, wait, wait, before you go there. <clears throat> um, you were talking about those leaders and it's AWS, Google, and Microsoft. Microsoft is there because of their relationship with with open AI. Microsoft, Microsoft's in the last place in my opinion. Well, but, but because of the business model, that they have the, they sort of cut the line, but so technically I, th I would agree with you. And then you got Databricks and Snowflake from a data platform perspective, they're making moves. And then you mentioned about, will, will people, will, will engineers stay at Google? I wanted to ask you, it's kind of like, it just popped into my head when you said that, you know how the NFL, take the quarterback out of the equation because if you don't have a good quarterback, you're, you're, you're in trouble. Compete, yeah. Just think about the New England Patriots. But um, <laughs> but I think about all the years as a Patriots fan, watching Belichick get rid of like great players like you know Ty Law and Logan Mankins and Richard Seymour. He just let them go. And what did he do? He replaced them. It's like, oh, pieces of meat, just come on in. I <laughs> is, is tech industry similar in that if enough talent stays in place and there's enough tribal knowledge and you bring in new talent, new younger talent, maybe that's uh, you know undervalued or underpaid, they step up very quickly. Is that is there a similar dynamic in the tech industry where a company like Google can actually turn over um, and still be incredibly successful or is it sort of same old, same old dynamic in the industry where you know companies get more mature and they start to lose their luster? What do you think? That's a good question. First of all, I love the metaphor with NFL because we love talking sports, but you know, not always exact, but close, right? So let's kind of break it down. So if you're a startup or you're a growing public company, let's just say you're a company like Airbnb or Dropbox or Box.net, uh, Box, and then call it Box.net anymore, old, old name. You're different category than say a hyperscaler. So the New England Patriots, when they were in their prime, I would, that they're the Amazon web services. They have the best system. And, and if you're going to use that talent thing, in the NFL, it only worked if the system worked. So Belichick had a system where he had uh, a lot of fungible capabilities, he could move people around, and he built a system around versatility of players. So in that system, you can get someone and cut a, um, a salary cap person or a high level person to another team and still not lose the, the system. You know, a node gets replaced, but it's, it's the balance of the system. That's the hyperscalers, they have that system. And so if you're a startup and you lose your core, like say one or two like systems person, or yeah, you're, you're large, in you're in trouble. So it really comes down to what that looks like. Now I will, now I will that being said, that's just kind of just general, you know, architecture 101 systems thinking. However, with the cloud right now, a lot of the best talents in their 20s. If you look at like Langchain, for instance, the guy right. Harrison, young kid, you know, <laughs> he's, he's adult, but like yeah, compared to us, you know, he's what I wanted to be 25 years old, right? Be, yeah, that's what I want to be right now, be 25 again. But so what I would be, in, so I think there's a crop of new talent that absolutely is what I call bomb throwers. They're the people who are throwing bombs at the old guys like us saying, get out of the way, I'm taking over. Um, and so, I think that's the, bet, the, the thing that's going on in this industry right now. Can the hyperscalers maintain that position where the young disruptors are going to come up, the bomb throwers, I call them, the disruptors are going to take territory. It happens in every single inflection point. PC took a territory away from the old uh, mini computers. The web took territory away from old business models. And, and then it goes on and on. And you're seeing it now with iPhone killed the Blackberry and Nokia, these are the number one phones in the world right before then. So, Right now, that's the war. And that's why you see people like Sam Altman and Microsoft going to Washington saying, regulate, we should regulate. You know why? They don't want the startups to get any traction. Those guys don't want startups to win. They want them to slow down. They want to control them. 
They want to put them in the ecosystem, into a bucket, like a cage, and you know, feed them, and you know, let them become the next meal for them. They need to subsume them. Amazon, quite frankly, is interesting. They might have an alternative approach. They might take the different approach to say, hey, we want to enable value. And, and Matt Garman, who I interviewed, got exclusive access to, got an exclusive interview. I asked him directly. He wants to be open to all foundational models, all Gen AI. So Amazon's playing the open card. They're playing, I want the startups to be back on my, my, my camp. And that's what made Amazon. If you look at Amazon Web Services, they would not be where they are today without startups. So clearly, that's the game. So to me, this is all a kind of interesting dynamic, a power dynamic in the industry. The big guys want to promote regulation because they want to be the evolutionary leader and be the sustainable model versus disruptive technology and you know, the, you know, the uh, innovator's dilemma, Dave, right? The startups are the ones that are going to make, the, make it happen. That's the silent war going on right now is that the startups are surging and the big guys are, are stuck in the middle between, it's a decision between, do they enable them as customers or they keep them in a cage? And yeah. that's going to be the tell sign. And we're going to be covering it. We're going to go into Amazon reInvent, uh, Microsoft show, we'll see what they're doing. And if Microsoft doesn't invite the cube to their show, then they're, the, they're caging people. You know, so, you talk about, about startups and this is a, a point that I think a lot of people miss and you just, you just nailed it. Amazon, you know, so many things about the cloud you know, agility, shifting CapEx to OpEx, uh, but innovation, I mean, people talk about innovation. Okay, yeah, there's innovation inside of Amazon, but a big part of that innovation flywheel, as you just pointed out, and Amazon had this more than any other cloud vendor by far, had startups building. Every startup would, you know, start the company, where do you go? You didn't start by saying, oh, I think I'll go to Azure. Maybe not happens now sometimes, because maybe, you know, Microsoft makes it attractive for them. But in the early days, you know, last decade, you would start with AWS, no question about it. I think still today, that's where you'd start. And you're not, you know, we wouldn't buy a Sun server and install a bunch of Unix and Oracle licenses. No, you went to the, to the cloud and you went to the Amazon cloud. And that was an innovation engine. And so I often, when I talk to, to customers and companies in, you know, that are, have an on-prem legacy, IBM, HPE, Dell, even Cisco last week, et cetera, very heavily on-prem, where are the startups in their ecosystems? Where are the startups in terms of, you know, coming on board and driving that innovation flywheel? And there's bits and pieces, you see them, you know, every now and then, but that, but that they're few and far between. And this is what's going to be interesting to see if a Snowflake or a Databricks or a Mongo, who are, as we know, John, they consider themselves platforms because they are, they're not products, they're not ISVs, no, that is these are not product companies, they're platform companies. Can they attract, will they attract startups? That's going to be a key enabler to their innovation flywheel. Yeah, and in fact, on SiliconANGLE, David Strom has an article called uh, The Cloud Conundrum, The Changing Balance of Microservices versus Monolithic Applications, riffing off your breaking analysis and also highlighting that article that went out that said that um, Amazon Prime's not using uh, microservices as much. And his point, right. his point is not so much as containers and microservices and Kubernetes versus a monolith, it's situational decision-making, right? If you have a small team of engineers, why the hell would you want to have a, like a complex microservices, highly you know, complex environment? So what's happening is, is that you have old legacy environments that need to move from VMware, VMs to say uh, containers, that's complex. There, microservices, you, you, you build everything. And then if you've got a small team, you can build a monolith as long as you plug it into something that's architecturally sound. So that's, they're not mutually exclusive. The point is we're in an era of choice, right? That's what's happening here. And I think that's the story that's coming out of the cloud players is what Gen AI is going to highlight very quickly. And I said this in my last, the last pod, it's going to highlight very quickly and reward those who can create product market fit and then go to growth. Okay, and, and what's happening now is, is that it's at the top of the stack, not the physical layer. So, you know, Gen 1 cloud of Amazon, as you pointed out, was for startups because the choice was build a data center, spend 50 to $100,000 of cash before you even get started to provision servers and software and a data center. Well, you put a credit card down, you get the product market fit. Well, the demo works and the VC gives me money. That was the choice, spend 100 grand, do a demo, get funding, put your credit card down, spend $10, get traction, get funding. So that's the, that was the multiple. Now that's that physical. 
that changed the game, storage, networking, servers. So Gen 1 cloud was all about making the infrastructure better, undifferentiated heavy lifting, as Andy Jassy calls it. Now scaling differentiated heavy lifting is what AI does. So now the, the game shifts to who can create the value with customers faster, right? That's the new game. So if you have an application and you're a developer, I just interviewed a CIO who quit for a big bank in New York. He's a big founder of a company. He's got a st multiple startups that he's done by himself. One of them has three employees. They already have product market fit and doing millions in sales. Millions, three people. So, And they, that's because they use AI to refactor the application layer use it on top of AWS or a cloud. So the game is going to shift to the top of the stack where the product market fit is going to accelerate to growth. And that's going to change the game. And I'm telling you right now, that's going to really bust people up a bit on the legacy side when you know young kid, when their friends in the dorm room come in and build the product and the people sitting in the, in the, in the boardroom, the big company, like who's this, who are these kids? And I tell you, that's coming fast. So, I want to pick up on something you said, and you mentioned microservices, and it, it, it sort of triggered something in my brain. I just did a breaking analysis with George Gilbert. We got the scoop on Snowflake through our research and just some digging, and we're gonna we're gonna drop that you know tomorrow um, on breaking analysis on what's coming up in in Snowflake Summit. Which, by the way, we haven't been NDA on this, um, at least not yet. So we want to break it before they NDA it. Hurry up, go. Share it right now. Yeah, and so. But basically, if you look at the Web 2.0 model, and you know this very well, you got separate analytic and, and, and um, uh, business intelligence platforms, which is you got BI and you got AI and ML, and they're separate, they're different platforms. And then you got microservices that sort of organize that application logic to get together. And, and, and in the future, these are going to be integrated. Operational and analytic systems are coming together. You're going to have unified business intelligence and AI and ML and you're going to organize the application logic as a digital twin of your business, like a real world representation of your business in a, in a, in a semantic layer. And what, what, for instance, we sort of, our epiphany is that what Snowflake is doing is enabling all these different data types to be able to compose the next level of data apps. And so, and you're likely going to be doing that using generative AI uh, and, and yeah. natural language processing, and you're going to comp dramatically compress the time it takes to develop applications. And, and the other thing, John, is it's it's a new breed of data apps, which is the completely different way to think about it. Think about Uber for businesses, you know, across all businesses, not just a custom Uber app. And that we think is going to be the next big battleground and who's going to be there. Yes, not only Snowflake and Databricks, but AWS, Microsoft announced Fabric, but, but by the way, it's way behind where, where Snowflake <laughs> is, but but they're working very closely with Databricks and they've, they've unified the analytic piece that you guys got to go somewhere else for the transaction piece. Oracle will say they already have it, but that's bullshit. I mean, it's it's just not true. It's a lot of legacy stuff, but they've done a good job with that legacy stuff. But it's but it's also AWS, Google uh, and Databricks and Snowflake and Microsoft all battling for that next generation of, of data apps. That's going to be a really interesting and fun thing to watch. And you're going to see a lot of it now accelerating because of generative AI. Yeah. I mean, I think that you're, you're completely right. The model's flipping, right? So again, the script is flipping, the top of the stack, some headlines I got going on right now for article I'm considering using for the Matt Garman scoop is the first headline says, uh, transforming businesses with generative AI an interview with Matt Garman, that's one. The other one is um, a commitment to silicon compute and model diversity, meaning foundation model diversity, fuels generative AI advancements. Third headline I'm looking at is fueling open source innovation and partner collaboration in generative AI. The, the fourth headline is empowering secure innovation and safeguarding data. Okay, so again, I'm playing with headlines and you know, there's our fifth one, choice, you know, uh, driving innovation, enabling choice. This is interesting. I mean, once one interview generated six potential headlines, six. <laughs> I've never written a story like that ever before where I could roll with three different titles in one interview. So what that, what that means is generative AI is hitting so much diverse landscape, whatever uh, you're looking at is going to change. And I call that, you know, beauties in the eye of the beholder model, where it's like, if you look at something, depending on who you are, what beautiful is, is what you think it is and what you want it to be. So if you want choice, 
you got choice. If you want silicon advancements and compute, you're going to get there. You want a foundation model diversity, you're going to want that. And, and, and by the way, that's the big debate right now, Dave, in the industry, which foundation model or LLM is going to rule the world and or how do you combine and mix and match those? Um, they're calling them cocktails, right? So, or ensembles is the word that they're using. You know, it's an ensemble of models or a cocktail um, because it's not one, it's a combination. So this generative AI stuff is totally legit um, and it's completely wild west moment, right? It's crazy. I mean, it's, yeah, so it's, 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 it's running wild right now and it's in a good way. Let me ask you a question. You were a decade ahead when you said data is the new development kit. I mean, it's, it's like so far ahead because yeah. the data is the new development kit now. So if I had to ask you, where was the best place to develop applications in the last 10 years? I think Web 2.0, mm -hmm. um, Web 2.0 plus, where was the best place to develop apps this past decade? The cloud, of course. Cloud, and yeah. which cloud? You say the Amazon AWS. cloud, right? AWS. But, but other, other well, let's, let's just well. do some examples. Uh, so, Dropbox, it's file sharing, it's FTP with a UI on it. That's yeah. the original, that was the original product, right? So, so, so w the, the battle in my view is going to be, where is the best place? Where is going to be the best place to build data apps in this new generation of apps? And I would argue that's going to be a combination of a cloud and the data platform. And it's going to be the data platform that makes it the easiest, fastest, best performance, lowest elapsed time and most cost efficient and productive to build apps and it's going to be it, done. It's, it's a good There's question. no question in my mind, it's going to be done on top of the cloud, most likely AWS cloud, but other clouds as well. We're kind of maybe not, yeah, they're catching up. And, but there's going to be another super cloud layer on top of that where you're going to build data apps. And I think right now Snowflake is an obvious participant player, front runner, as is Databricks, as, is, uh, as are the three cloud companies and as are TBD, if somebody will emerge. Well, if, you, if, I, if I have to look forward and try to guess the next 50, by the way, that was 19, um, 2007 when I wrote that post. Okay, so that <laughs> just to put it in perspective, okay? 15 years ago, 20 years ago, coming up on podcasting, it's interesting how the journey's been. But uh, I tell you, to me, there's, I always look at, look at innovation in two flavors. You bolt something onto something or you build an abstraction layer on top of it. That's like the, the architectural operating model of innovation in technology. You either you make something, abstract away something complex and make it simple, and then you get adoption, or you bolt onto something to accelerate something else. So you either bolt on or overlay on top. So to me, I think, if we look at AI, I'm thinking to myself, okay, why was Amazon successful? Because they created an alternative to getting something up and running fast and more performant, AKA a SaaS app and cheap. You know, credit card swipe, you're on Amazon with provisioning your desktop app into the cloud. You can go show a VC a demo. That was my example earlier. AI is going through that same kind of moment where how fast can I stand up something of value and how expensive will it be? Can I do it for less? Okay, so there's going to be an Amazon Web Services moment for AI. The question is, you can't just build a CapEx cloud for LLMs and foundation models, it's too expensive. So it's going to happen on top of a cloud. So it's either AWS, Azure, or Google in that order, or now Oracle, people who have CapEx. Fitzy would love this conversation at Platformomics because that's whole premises that the CapEx is the advantage. Our super cloud premise came from the fact that Snowflake and or these companies can build on top of the CapEx and be the next AWS on top of AWS. So this is the, why I said the disrupting model versus sustainer. So if you're going to build on something, you either build on it and leverage it. And that's what I think AWS is going to do. And I think Microsoft's probably in their boardroom right now going, you know, like this, what do we do? What do we do? Do we, do we open up the kimono and build on top? Or do we go in and try to cage all these people in our ecosystem like our old way, you know, and keep them in the ecosystem and milk office and all of our apps. Well, they're, they're, real they're more in an innovator's dilemma than AWS is in my opinion. <clears throat> Microsoft's got to make that choice. If Amazon stays true to the startup, then your question would be, which company will build that service? Okta ML is one example that Madrona invested in. Jerry Trent at Greylock's got an investment in this area. Whoever can stand up that service where I can just deploy my data and get the benefits will win. That's and I think that that data is going to be real time data. That's going to be a key. And you're going to use organizations are going to use data and AI 
to to actually create or orchestrate that what I was calling before the digital twin of your business, that Uber for business, the people, the places, the things, and all the activities associated with that, where these 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 real time data products, if you will, are elements that can be brought together to actually do stuff. And that's going to be really interesting. Well, the over, it's got to be overlay. It's got to be an overlay. Well, but, but, but wait, yeah, but wait, but it says a lot of that data is going to be in the cloud, but a lot of data is not going to be in the cloud. It's going to be at the edge. Now the edge is messy right now. We know this. We were actually talking to, you know, one of the folks, one of the engineers who was in the, at Cisco live when he was asking us, he was over here. He overheard us at dinner talking to uh, <laughs> Zeus and he's like, hmm, that's interesting. What do you think of the edge? You know, and it's true, it's messy right yeah, now. It's real time, uh, but, real time. But, but it's that's the thing, it's real time. And so I think some new type of, right now it's all the, all the rage is, you know, who's got the best LLM? I think that's going to evolve, quote unquote, up the stack to like, who's got the best user experiences based on great data, and great LLMs and foundation models, yeah. but then, then combining that into a user experience, that that's going to be where the value is created. It's not the LLM in and of itself, it's the user experience that's going to be built on top of that and how you apply that LLM to create a great user experience and user value. Well, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, you're exactly right, but I would also add to that and say that the user experience with the LLNs, whether it's an ensemble or cocktail, whatever you call it, it's going to be a combination of models. And those combinations of models got to be selected properly so that you have all the IP rights protected and that the licensing are lined up. You don't want to put your IP into a, a, a public MLM like, like OpenAI because you lose the rights to that IP. So you're going to want to have you know, some sort of relationship of single tenant meets public. So the private cloud, public cloud kind of dynamic, number one. Number two, those apps also have, are going to not change the laws of physics. You still got to store stuff, move packets from point A to point B. So you're going to see, you're going to need to have physical layer innovation. In other words, if you're at the edge in real time and you got your watch on or you got an app or whatever in your factory floor with a robot making Audi cars, whatever it is, they need data. Like you still have to get data to the spot. So you have availability of data, highly available. Um, uh, high availability, those two words mean things, you know, high, high availability doesn't mean highly available. It's a semantic did, definition, but. Did, you, you, you're talking about IP. Did you see that TikTok thing that with, with the CEO of Ford? Did you hear this? What story? I wonder if I can, I can, wonder if I can play this. Hold on a second. Let me try to play this. I'll put it right up to the mic. This is unbelievable. Listen to this. Hold on. If I explain to you know the listeners how crazy our software system is and why it's so difficult for legacy car companies to get software right, you you be it, it just well, I'll do it very quickly. Yeah. So say probably five hundred dollars a vehicle, or let's say three hundred fifty quid a vehicle. Yeah, we we farmed out all the modules that control the vehicles to our suppliers because we could bid them against each other. So Bosch would do the body control module, someone else would do the seat control module, someone else would do the engine control module. Right. And, and we'd have about 150 of these modules with semiconductors all through the car. The problem is the software are all written by, you know, 150 different companies and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> so even though it says Ford on the front, yeah. I actually have to go to Bosch to get permission to change their C control software. So wow. even if I had a high speed modem in the vehicle and, and I had the ability to write their software, it's actually their IP. And I have 150, we call it the loose confederation of software providers, 150 completely different software programming languages, you know, all, all the structure of the software is different. It's in millions of code and we can't even understand it all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, that's why at Ford, we've decided in the second generation product, completely in-source electric architecture. So, right. so, so he was talking about basically saying, that's Ford CEO, basically yeah, says, he, tipping the hat to Tesla for having the advantage. Floyer told me five or six years ago, I think it was when Tesla made the decision to not go with Mobileye, and that's what's coincided with them doing their own, you know, ARM-based architecture for chips, because they wanted to be able to control their own data and IP destiny. Yeah, and uh, you hear the Ford CEO. I mean, yeah. 
Everybody's going to be facing this problem. Yeah, that's, that just completely validates everything that I've been saying about open source. So this is why open source wins, okay? What that highlights is Ford and whoever they are, companies, want to be involved in open source, because open source is where the fastest innovation is. And once it's in the open, you then bring it in and you harden it. Open source is where all the eyes are on, it's collective intelligence, it's a great algorithm for having things most, mostly secure, but to the extent that you can customize it, that's key. And why I'm bringing this up is because the advantages of that helps the Fords of the world, which are the big enterprises. It could be for banks as well, but they need security. So here's what's going to happen. Open source is going to completely turbocharge growth, more growth than we're even seeing right now. And number two, the business model of venture capital will move to open source because the people that nail those projects will be end up starting commercial companies to support Ford, Ford and the companies. So the Red Hat model, which we always say, will there be another Red Hat, Dave? Well, guess what? There might be in this <laughs> generation because yeah. of that specific reason. And that's that, funny. We, you used to say Red Hat will be the next Red Hat, right? Well, I mean, we, it, we, right? we, we were looking at the, the landscape of the current, but if you start to look forward and look at that trend yeah, yeah. And, we are, and that video right there to me puts an exclamation point on the fact that proprietary software is dead. Now you can take proprietary software and embed it into your own stuff, but buying off the shelf uh, proprietary hardware and software, probably not going to be viable. And again, you know, JJ uh, would love this, uh, Joseph Jacks would love this because he runs OSS fund, big VC fund around open, commercial open source. But you know, to me, that is, the, that is the play. And I guarantee you this series A market wait, wait. Explain will go that. down. Yeah, explain that because people are going to be confused by what you just said. They're going to say, well, wait a minute, John, if it, it, it doesn't open, doesn't that to, uh, speak to doing your own proprietary software? If I'm open, isn't that going to be subjecting me to more, you know, IP leakage. Explain why that's not the case. Okay, so here, so here's here's why it's not the case. Let's just say that you and I come up with the, the Cube app, and we open source and we say we want to have a, a new kind of knowledge system called the Cube, where it's the best um, thoughts from the, all of our guests brains that we've interviewed over the years. We put in, we hey, good idea. Yeah. Hey, good idea, it's called the Cube, <laughs> Cube AI. The CubeAI.com, check it out. It's uh, wait list only right now. If we open source that, we create a community, let's just say then, um, you know, 10,000 developers jump in and work with us and we create an open source. That software's on, on GitHub, it's free for everybody. People are contributing and making the software better, it becomes the most kick-ass thing. Then anyone can use it. They can take their own YouTube videos and, and do that cube uh, library for them. Okay, and they can take that and use that benefit as a collective donation, if you will, or contribution to society. We might want to have the intimate knowledge of our engineering team to pull that out and build on top of it our own cube specific thing. Okay, and then hire the, the, the foundation and the open source to support it or create a company called the Cube Inc. that sells it to corporations and we charge support because we know the most about the code. That's what Red Hat did with Linux. That's the business model that you think you're going to see more of coming out of the woodwork with this new wave because the, 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 the upside for the corporations is to have more open source and have a supporting vendor like a Red Hat type to support it. And that's why I think um, that's going to in increase the open source. So, you know, we'll see, but all data points to that because that Ford interview just absolutely proves the point that that market is selling license and proprietary IP can be replicated in open source and then deployed and supported by a company. That's a better scenario, if yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. That's really interesting, John. I think, look, I, I, I mean, the future is changing right before, is happening, occurring right before our eyes. We, we've talked about this before. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but we've seen so many waves. I mean, this wave is moving so, so quickly. Um, you know, maybe the funding environment is not as insane. I don't think it is as it was in, in the dot-com days. Uh, it'll probably get there. I kind of like that, that it's more of a slow roll. Uh, it seems like the funding environment's more like what we saw in the cloud, mobile, social, big data. Um, maybe a little bit more concentrated than that. Um, and and maybe in that sense, it's it's bubblicious within AI and not as broad based as the cloud, mobile data and, and uh, social and big data, um, but not as s stupid and feeding frenzy as was the dot-com. And so it's a different dynamic, but it's happening, I think, in terms of the pace of innovation, it's happening faster than anything I've ever seen before. It's insane. 
The, uh, there's, some, there's some China news here I want to get to, but there's some breaking news around AWS, I mean Amazon, um, that I want to get to. Uh, did you hear that Sequoia is breaking up their firm into three companies, one for China, which is under scrutiny for their partner Chen there, who's been accused of um, you know, mishandling and redirecting funds to China and all kinds of corruption. Um, that's interesting um, news, news coming out of that. India fund, which is going to be for that emerging market, which is booming. And then finally, the, the, their, their normal fund. Um, and I just saw that um, people are moving, OpenAI is moving their engineers out of, or Microsoft's moving their engineers out of China. Um, they're moving their top AI researchers from China, Beijing to Vancouver, and part of a way to stop the Chinese companies from poaching them. So interesting dynamic, Microsoft doing that. So, so China dynamic going on there, Dave, continue to be politics. Now the DOJ, I'm sorry, the, the uh, um, Microsoft, I'm sorry, Amazon, I can't control all these big, these big tech companies. Amazon and Apple, okay, the federal judge rules that Apple and Amazon must face an antitrust lawsuit accusing them of conspir conspiring to inflate iPhone and iPad prices on AWS, Amazon's website. Hmm. Hmm. Just hitting, just hit. Reuters got the story and uh, Western District Why, are, are iPhones more expensive on a in Amazon than they are on other places? The Western District of, of uh, the Western District of Washington, Floyd versus Amazon and Apple Inc. United States District Court for the Western District of Washington. Yeah, but but I mean, I don't know. I've never purchased any. I might have purchased, you know, headphones or something from Apple. On Lawsuit Amazon, that claims Apple Apple and Amazon elbowed out resellers. We'll proceed. I don't know oh. why I brought that up. Maybe well, to trigger well, your that's rant. Different, but, trigger your rant. But that's that's Mina that's Khan. different, right? I mean, I, I. But I mean, seriously, are are Apple products more expensive on Amazon than they are elsewhere? It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you can just mm -hmm. Google them and find the best price. Go to an, go to an Apple store. Yeah, the price is always pretty consistent for anything new. I know, it just seems ridiculous. And there's a good black market, not black market, but used market for this stuff. I mean, I don't know. Is that really the problem that we're trying to solve is yeah. I mean, it's iPhone just, it's prices? More, I mean, more, really? and more, more and more government work announced. Now, your favorite topic, blockchain and crypto, because you love crypto as, as do I, but you, you, I do. You, you're more bullish on me, but the hammer's coming down on crypto. The SEC sued Binance and the founder CZ, Cheng Peng Zhao, uh, on securities violation. And the SEC is suing Coinbase, alleging that it, it's operating an unprecedented, unregistered, I'm sorry, unregistered exchange. Well, Binance, so, say SE chair off, offered to advise the crypto company in 2019. So the guy who's the chairman, SEC chair, Gary Gensler, yeah. offered to Gensler's, be an advisor to Binance. Now he's suing them. Yeah, he's, Gen, Gensler is out to yeah, get crypto. I mean, Let's see. So I think Binance and Coinbase are two different stories, uh, but they're getting lumped together as you know bad people. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think Brian Armstrong's always been pretty forthcoming about, hey, we we want your guidance on being regulated, and you know lay down some guardrails or some not guardrails, but but guidelines. And Gensler has said, well, the guidelines are already there. You're you should be regulated by the SEC just like any other. Uh, uh, security. And so for obvious reasons, Coinbase is saying, well, we're not though. We're not that, that we're not a security. You know, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're this exchange and, and Gensler saying, yeah, you are. All I got to do is find one example of a crypto that, that really is a security and I'm coming after you. And there probably are, they probably push the envelope a little too, too hard, but Coinbase is, I think a good company. I, I don't, I mean, they are trying to, I think, skirt the system because it'd be expensive as hell if they had to get regulated. I think Binance is a totally different situation. I think, I think, uh, I think Coinbase, I'd call it like, don't ask, don't tell, you know, tell us what to do. And, and he throws that back at the government because he knows they're never going to solve the problem. And, and I think Gensler smarts, Gensler saying, hey, we have the rules, you got to follow them. And I think that's probably going to end up okay. And it's going to probably cost Coinbase more money. Binance is different. Binance, yeah, I mean, I have, Binance is international. By the, way, I, uh, by the way, I have experience with both platforms. I've been, I've invested on both. I've, I've 
purchased crypto on both platforms, you know, years and years and years ago. And Binance, interestingly enough, so there was there used to not be a Binance US, it was just Binance. And then um, when the US started coming after them, the US government, they said, all right, we're gonna we're gonna ask all the US customers to move their assets into Binance US. Okay, so if you're a US customer, you gotta you, you gotta move your your assets into Binance US or you're not gonna be able to access it. So I said, uh oh. This isn't going to end well. And I decided not to move my assets. I moved a bunch of them out into a, 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 a an air uh, air gap vault. But I kept some in there just for kicks because I like to pay attention. It forces you to pay attention. But I decided to, to keep those assets into the Binance Classic, okay? And you could get around it. You could go on a VPN. You could, you know, mask your IP, and you could actually still log in for a while. And then that stopped recently. Um, and then the emails emerged where uh, the CEO of Binance is basically talking to you know people in his organization, saying we got a big customer in Chicago and you know let's keep servicing them. As well, when I leave the country, I can log into my Binance Classic account. Yeah. Okay, so Binance very clearly is breaking the law on purpose, and there's evidence of that. It, it appears allegedly, but there allegedly there's evidence, and it appears that. They're Which screwed. law? U.S. law? Yes. Or international yes. law? Yes. Yeah. U.S. law. Yeah, yeah. And so, so um, yeah, the international law, they're still cranking. So SiliconANGLE, SiliconANGLE.com, that's our site, with all the news there. Binance story up there. Binance U.S. to halt customer dollar withdrawals amid SEC lawsuit. They informed users that they would yeah. lose their ability to withdraw their dollar funds from its platform next Tuesday. Yeah, um, right. And so, they also, no, so, they're no longer yeah. accepting dollar deposits. So here yeah. they are. Boom, freeze. Right, so so you could tell years ago, you could tell Binance was it, it gonna, that was not gonna end well. <laughs> Again, coin, Coinbase, I think is a completely different situation. Coinbase I think is the, legit, they gotta just, Coinbase yeah. should just, I mean, the, I, I, I think this is an example. This is, we'll get to the rant section now. I got two rants, I'll start with Coinbase. And it wasn't planning on ranting on Coinbase, but I'll start. Uh, let's get to the rant section, so let's go. Coinbase is legit. Right. They need to be out there. The government should work with them. They're a legit entrepreneurial venture. Yeah, do the audit, do what you got to do. Binance, they're international. That's a black box. I wouldn't even go in there. I'd have no, no, boom. But Coinbase, they're in the Bay Area. They employ a lot of people. They're doing the right thing. The government's the one that's screwing them over. So, yeah, that's that's my rant on the crypto. Um, well, you, uh, you want to rant on crypto I, or? You, I, I do, I want the same rant, but, but different. So, uh, um, I heard Gensler on TV with Kramer uh, this past week uh, when we were out in Las Vegas. And uh, Gensler, <laughs> I mean, for all the duplicity, like you said, he was trying to advise Binance, uh, but he had a strong case. <laughs> he basically says, I got these guys dead to rights. And I think he's got, Bi uh, he's got Coinbase too. And I think they're going to have to play balls and they will. But then Kramer starts ranting on crowd, all crypto is crap. These things are worthless. Um, now, one thing I don't agree with Gensler, by the way, is he said, we have currencies. We have the US dollar. We have the Japanese yen. We have the euro. We have the British pound sterling. Why do we need another currency? Well, hmm, let's see, 2008 financial crisis. <laughs> let's just print more money. I mean, it's the poster child. It's the ba basically the case for Bitcoin. Now, in and of course, Kramer threw all crypto under the bus, said they're all worthless paper. Of course, they're not paper, they're digital assets. And, and he just started ranting on all crypto, like, you know, he's 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 the guy to protect the, the little guy. Kramer made a bunch of dough in crypto. Okay, Novogratz would come on CNBC and talk about how great crypto is, and the guy's like really compelling. And, you know, after that, the price of crypto always goes up because people are like, he gets people excited, he's a great salesperson. And Kramer made a bunch of money on crypto, okay? You think he's so hiding the ball on really, that one? No, I think it's known, it's well known. He talked about it. He's not He's not hiding it, but he's not advertising it now. He's like flipped and he's like, I'm for the little guy, get rid of these assets, don't, I mean, he's full of crap. And so it's just, you know, he he made his money just like Chamat. Now, now they're out onto the next thing. But I, here's my, and then Kathy Woods was on today. She owns Coinbase and she was saying, 
um, and has said in the past, she thinks Bitcoin, she said Bitcoin's going to five or 600,000. <laughs> her, her positive case is Bitcoin's going to a million. I love her. I think she's awesome. I think she's really smart. She's ballsy. And, um, but, but I, I still, you know, Chamat on, on All In said crypto's dead. I, I don't think it's dead. I, I think a lot of cryptos are going to be dead. Yeah, Chamath was the fraud. hardcore crypto guy way back I know. in the day. And, he made so and much he made money. a lot of dough. He made a well, lot. Well, but he, to his credit, he's he's ahead of the game. You know, he he he, he made a lot of dough on SPACs, and then he got out. Yeah. So wherever Chamath is, he's probably going to make a lot of money, and it's probably going to blow up, and there's going to be a lot of scams. But he's going to be, you know, squeaky clean. Yeah. It's, Oh, Mark Andreessen but I calls think, that the bootlegger. Yeah, I mean, Joe Kennedy, Yeah. right? Joe Kennedy made hundreds of millions of dollars basically bootlegging. Okay, hey, they're <laughs> entrepreneurs. So anyway, I, I think that, you know, Kramer's full of shit and I think Coinbase is going to be just fine. And I think Binance, you know, maybe I'll get, I got a, a little bit of dough in there. I'll get out next time I'm in London, maybe. <laughs> so my other rant is the Mark Andreessen article he wrote on AI. I know Mark Andreessen, VC um, at uh, Andreessen Horowitz, Palo Alto guy, uh, wife is uh, the daughter of uh, you know, a big developer in Stanford. Um, they, he's a hermit. Everyone knows he kind of stays in his house, doesn't go out much, hates going out in the world. Um, he wrote the seminal post years ago on why software is eating the world, it's almost 12 years ago. He just penned another one um, uh, it says AI is going to save the world, 7,000 word blog post. Now, first of all, let me just put a disclaimer out there before I start hammering uh, Andrew's horse. He blocked me on Twitter. So that's one. So there's no reason to block me on Twitter. So, so he's a tool for doing that, Dave. That's my rant number one. So Andrew's Horowitz blocking all the media people, which by the way, I was a fan of him before he blocked me. So now he, he's got, he's got a, a, an un, I've been unfanned. So I'm not a fan given, he blocked me. So that's the logic. This article is a little bit out there, but he's basically saying that regulation, AI will save the world. And he, he brings this interesting comparison about, he calls it, you know, during the Luddites come out of the woodwork and that he calls it when regulation comes in, you get the bootleggers. The bootleggers who take advantage of the, of the regulation, like during the prohibition. Um, and then you have the, you know, the people who are high society, thought leaders, they don't make any money because they're too busy, you know, pontificating about thought leadership. So he calls them, he calls them the, 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 pan, the moral panic missionaries. He uses the word Baptists. He calls the moral pa pa panic missionaries Baptists and those who take advantage of the hysteria as bootleggers, they earn the money from the regulation. Uh, James Farrell and our team wrote a great post on this on siliconangle.com. Um, but Mark's kind of out there. He's, I think they've been very weird. They do all their things direct. They're, they've always been a wall of Silicon Valley. They always, they, always, they always wanted to be their own vertically integrated Silicon Angle. And I don't, I mean, Silicon Valley. I don't, I don't like the post. I think it's, it's, it's out there. It's not as clean as Software Eating the World, which I thought was a great post. That one set the agenda. This one was more of a FU to the industry and, and kind of a very self-serving post. You know, Mark Andreessen got lucky, built the browser. What has he done lately? So come on, get, oh. <laughs> come on, get, get on the ball. Made a lot of cash. So um, <laughs> I want to give a plug to uh, uh, to Mug Mugley, Bob Mugley, his book just came out, uh, Datapreneurs. He's got something going on in Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm, I'm not around that week, but he's got a book signing or something. You should go. But yeah, but he had this great curve in there, this, this you know, the innovation of, of, of data. And he had a line, you know, an arrow going to, here's where we are now, it's LLMs. And not too much further, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, like by all oh, by by 2050, the thing ended. And he had general artificial intelligence in there and singularity is not that far away. And so basically the end of humanity is, he didn't say that, but I inferred from his chart. And then a guy from, I think the CEO of Coursera said, you know, basically um, we got nothing to worry about with AI, um, which, I, I wouldn't totally agree with, but um, because that was kind of a, an interesting little angle that I wanted to to, th to throw in there. Yeah. Um, I mean, the AI it, it, is only as good as what we make it. I mean, I think the human plus AI is better than AI has been what we've been saying on the cube. And I think everyone we talk to that's smart is all saying that you got to let it run. And this is why I'm hardcore about this big war between the um, the big companies like AWS, Azure, and Google as they fight amongst themselves for supremacy. You also have the dynamic, if this is truly an inflection point, again, by our definition, 
an inflection point is a seminal structural change, a tectonic shift. Plates are shifting where something new completely takes over the old. PC generation, Steve Jobs in his 20s, Bill Gates in his 20s, that whole crew replaced the complete generation of computer leads before them. If that's the case right now, then Amazon, Azure, and Google will all have to fall to the side or keep up with the new talent. And the question is, will the startups capture that or is it an environment the first time in history where both can participate given this a level playing field on agility? So if everyone's, all things being equal or agile, they both should be able to coexist. That to me mm. is what we're watching right now. I'm watching that very closely and squinting through the PR of those hyperscalers because you can see their moves. Microsoft is very closed, very much putting people in the cages. You don't see a lot of ecosystem startups coming out of Microsoft. They're very scripted. Meanwhile, Amazon's got people all over the world on there. LinkedIn spreading the word, they're all open. Matt Garman on the record says, we're open, we'll run every single model on AWS, including OpenAI. Google, well, so they have a, a chance to completely change the game. They open the kimono with their AI, with Bard, they could then influence this next generation of developers. And so all that going on with powering open source, Dave, it's going to be a rumble in the next five to 10 years. So, you know, I would say it's, I don't think it's the first time in history, by the way, I would argue that the, the internet was an example where the incumbents, I'd say the incumbents who? took more, more advantage. Who? Name them. Well, flip, flip it. Who took, who, who emerged in the internet as IBM disruptor? didn't do that great. Hold on, who, who emerged in the internet as the, the Google. disruptor? Am, Amazon. Google. Well, Yahoo started, let's go ahead. Amazon, the okay, search let's engines. name them. Search let's engines. go through them. Amazon, S Google, Cisco. keep Cisco. going. Cisco. Okay, Cisco. they were an incumbent. No, they weren't. No. They were started in 95. They're basically in the 90s. Yeah, they had a router that connected offices. That weren't they really the internet. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you Cisco. You so get, Amazon you gotta, you gotta and, and by the okay, uh, if I'm going to give you Google, I could argue Google was cloud, but I guess it was before cloud. So Amazon, Google, Google Cisco. Google basically who else? invented cloud. Salesforce. Amazon, Amazon, Google, Cisco. Who else? Salesforce. Um, companies like Salesforce was cloud before cloud. They had their own cloud, basically with Oracle. Salesforce I mean, was. If, if Larry Ellison. Salesforce wasn't internet. Would you, would you, was that Salesforce internet company, or would you say well, they were the came first out of SaaS the company? You well, could say SaaS the first isn't. cloud. I consider SaaS part of the internet revolution. See, I think it's more cloud, SaaS. Okay, hold on. Cloud wasn't, the internet was a generational shift. Cloud was not. I agree. Cloud but was I'm, all, all I'm saying is, that, all I'm saying is that the, the incumbents Big companies yeah. got a lot out of the internet. Walmart. I would put, I would put, well, yeah. <laughs> well, Walmart had physical <laughs> goods too, but they were smart. They put physical and digital, but then they got killed by Amazon. So look, if you, I think you put the internet from- They didn't get you, killed? Walmart didn't get killed. They're kicking ass. Well, I mean, Amazon came in, took over the, the e-commerce piece. They Disrupted didn't. retail, but I'd give you Amazon. No question. Yeah. eBay, eBay. eBay was a okay. winner, yeah, in that generation. I mean, I would consider so, 94, consider like 1994, 95, what they called it the information superhighway. That was when the internet was connecting people. So the web came on around 95, 96, 97, kind of kicked in and it was early growth and the, it was very minimal functionality. So put that as a marker, that's a marker. And then take that through cloud, say 2010. That to me is a generational shift. PC 78, 77, 78, say 80 you know, okay, to 94, right? A 15 year run. So, you know, you got these 15 year windows, 10, 10 to 20 year windows. Um, iPhone was an exception. I think that was a game changer, but that built on top of the mobile web 2.0, which created the SaaS at the same time. So the SaaS exploded, cloud exploded, iPhone moment, boom. Now cloud comes here and now we're at AI. So I think that that compressed there and you put it all there and now you got the next wave coming. So the next wave to me is why people are freaking out why Andreessen wrote that post, you know, the moral, moral uh, um, uh, people, you know, shaking the alarm, you know, gloom and doom and you got the bootleggers and you got the, the, uh, the Bappas as they call them. So I think that's what's happening. And they, the, so the question is, is this an inflection point like those moments where it's like PC, internet web, AI. Well, so again, so I'm going to try to, as you're talking, I'm making my case here. So we got Amazon, Google, Cisco, were the sort of disruptors and they had the benefit of it. I got on the incumbents, 
Because that's what we're talking about. Can the incumbents take advantage? I got Dell, Walmart, Apple, Microsoft. Well, Microsoft really didn't take advantage of the internet. They almost, they missed it. And then they came back later. So I'll take Microsoft on my list. Dell, Walmart, Apple, the banks, JP, Morgan Chase, Citi, Fidelity, B of A, Goldman, FedEx, Intel. These were incumbents that took advantage of the internet. Yeah, they're you know, Intel, they were they're, they're implementers of it. They're that's, not the, no, that's what I'm saying. Inco oh, I'm sorry. When I say incumbents, I mean existing like companies, like uh, uh, the buyers of tech, right? Yeah. Who become well, tech yeah, companies. Well, I'm, okay, I'm, referring, so I'm referring to enablers, like the, the supplier. You're talking about pure play tech companies. No, the buyers of technology. Citibank. Yeah, but everybody. Everybody's a technology company these days, but yeah, okay, oh, well, fair enough. Well, that's because they became. I, I see what you're saying. That's why I was going to kind of triggered me because I'm saying no. Right, it's I'm, the talking buyers IBM, I'm talking about IBM. I'm talking about IBM, Digital Equipment Corporation, Prime Mini Computer, Hewlett Packard. You know, well, they, yeah. the, the well, Silicon yeah, Graphics okay. no longer. MIPS. You know, generation okay, so who got company. screwed? Okay, who got screwed during the the dot the dot com? Which incumbents got hosed in the dot com? Well, every, I mean, everyone got hosed on the dot-com bubble, right? So no, 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 not the bubble. I mean, which, like, so Amazon, but that was, in, again, industry. That was retail, yeah. right? I mean I, I think, mean, I think if you look at an example of the web and that bubble. So Cisco, Walmart, really? Walmart, Cisco. Would, Walmart would be an example of a company that rode that wave and crossed over, but still had the two-pronged strategy of physical and online, okay? Um, uh, companies that went out of business with, like, all these um, Sun Microsystems went out of business. Um, um, I guess what I'm saying is that the PC era yeah. completely disrupted Prime, Wang, DG, yeah. Yeah. Apollo, mm -hmm. killed them. Killed, right? killed the micro, proprietary network operating yeah. systems. The, the okay. microprocessor-based architectures destroyed the, the mini yeah. computer business. And enabled, and enabled TCP IP, which came out of the OSI model, Open Systems Interconnect. And that was right. standardized the physical layer to the transport and session layer, right? And, so, the, and then the internet comes out and so Cisco took advantage of that and, and yeah. disrupted all the existing network SNA and yeah, DEC the husband and, and wife and Stanford and they okay. funded and they John and they okay. took, so took but, over. But, but but the internet didn't do the same. Netscape gone. Yahoo irrelevant. Um AOL gone. Well not gone, but irrelevant. Right? So all the granddaddy technology companies of the internet really didn't have a a lasting impact. Well, the durability, the durability question comes down to, were they durable in their differentiation sustainability or was it incompetent management? Some would say Yahoo had incompetent management, but they but, had the brand position. Google's ongoingly killing it. They're doing great. So they could survive. But which companies Microsoft. got disrupted? Which companies got disrupted Microsoft. by the internet? Like, like not really. Microsoft didn't get, that was, they, they, they didn't really even ever get disrupted. They just became irrelevant. So. That's all I'm saying. I mean, the internet really didn't kill IBM. I mean, that was well, IBM was self-inflicted well, for other reasons. Well, that's why. That's or HPE, HP, HP really wasn't hurt by the internet. Okay. Dell was helped by. I tried it. to explain this to you before. We were kind of arguing, and maybe you weren't getting it. We'll try to explain it to you. So here's what I was saying before. That's really condescending, so, but bring it on. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you have vendors that supply people, and you were just saying about Citibank. All these people have applications. The internet killed old school old guard ways of doing things, business models. And that's what I was saying earlier in the pod about the AI having impact. So for example, the entrepreneur I was just interviewing today, he's got a healthcare app with three people doing millions of dollars in revenue. Okay, for healthcare. Okay, he's disrupting healthcare himself, his application. That is an example of what that does. You're trying to put it in a box, say, oh, the vendor IBM got replaced by this company. He just made my case. No, it's it's two pronged. You just made my case. You just happen. completely contradicted it, yourself. It doesn't you said, happen. No, Dave, I'm no, no, hold on. You said, it doesn't Dave, happen I'm without the other. You said, I'm talking about technology companies. Okay. And now you're just talking about healthcare. Yeah, but Dave, the enablement of the internet definitely shifted and took people out. We, we just talked that through, those companies. The suppliers, the incumbents, and a, there's a long list from Sun Microsystems, proprietary gear. That to, wasn't internet. That wasn't the internet. They fucking, they, they, they capitalized on the internet. Micro, uh, son and those guys because well, not, not not Scott McNeely was on the cube. He said I should have called it the the cloud. The network is the computer. They actually <laughs> they, they actually had yeah, but they actually had the they actually, they actually, had, the, they actually, they actually had which, they actually had the cloud names. and they didn't they they didn't tell me which companies, which tech companies specifically got disrupted by the internet the way the mini computer companies got disrupted. It's hard to name. They benefited from the internet. That's all I'm saying and so. 
I think the same thing can happen with AI. I mean, we, the, who, the, who, the internet didn't have a supplier, right? The, the internet is the supply. It's like the well, oxygen. You should mention Cisco. You mentioned, uh, I mentioned Netscape. They were internet companies. No, they, they, you know, they were internet enabled companies that built software for browse the websites. Okay, well, there was no Netscape incumbent. Did. There, was, there, was, no, there was no websites before Netscape, so they didn't really disrupt anyone. Well, no, they no disrupted, PCs. They disrupted, the, no li PCs they, they disrupted the, the Boston Public Library. Wozniak. They disrupted right? the I mean, Boston Public Library. Netscape. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, Netscape, Amazon disrupted. Netscape was a browser that served websites. There was a handful of websites, not many, and those websites had information on them. Okay, there was no one to I'm just saying, the it waves was, it was, are it was a, it was a net new. It can, it, but this all started with your, your saying, you said for the first time in history. Yes. Right? Yes. Incumbents, incumbents might be able to take advantage of yeah. this new because wave. There's, and I'm saying. Because the suppliers in the market, and, like I, I compare it more to the PC revolution, that's why I use that analogy, because there were suppliers like IBM DEC that sold computing to big companies like Ford. And Ford's going, yeah. I don't can't handle my license. I got too many things going on. I got business problems. So those companies were eliminated or reduced to, to rubble by the PC and what came after it. Right, and that didn't happen in the internet. I think you agree. Because it's, you new, it's new functionality. There's nothing to disrupt. And okay. There was computing serving people for companies so, to, to, to and, do stuff. And so the, the, the debate we're having, I think, is what's going to happen with AI? And I'm saying AI has suppliers right now. You got OpenAI went with Microsoft, but they went the other way around. You have cloud out there with AWS and Azure providing computing power. So companies like is OpenAI going to disrupt Google? That's a good question. That one they did the mafia deal with uh, Microsoft potentially. We'll see what happens. Again, I what think we're what's going to happen. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think you're going to have new disruptors come out. No question about it. But I think the existing guard which the old guard, you know, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, <laughs> the old guard is going to be able to take advantage of AI for their business because they have such massive businesses. They're going to be able to drive productivity right to the bottom line and they're going to be doing just fine. And they're going to miss something that maybe it's open AI or some other startup cohere. Somebody's going to come up with some new business model. So I think it's going to be a tide that lifts all boats. I mean, I know it's a bromide, but I think that's what's going to happen. Right. And that's probably, the, the the first time in history, I mean, I think the internet is more similar in that regard, is what the debate we were just having. The debate, the, then the first time in history would be referred to that DEC, IBM, those guys would not die, they'd all adopt. And the reason why they do yes. die is because they have either bromide or dogma or don't see it or can't react fast enough. Self-inflicted wounds, but I'm saying the no, same no, my, thing my, happened at the internet. My premise is, is that if this market where agility is all equal, assume that let there's me, some decent management, they could then capture it. So, so again. I agree, okay. I agree, but let me try to summarize my, my, my statement. I, I, this is where I think we disagree. I think the AI wave is going to be more like the internet in that it's going to, the incumbents are going to be able to take advantage of it. I think the difference is going to be, you're going to see more disruptors come out of the technology industry, whereas I don't think you had a lot of disruptors coming out of the technology industry per se. You certainly saw it with Amazon, um, but but the incumbents took advantage of it. I think it's more like the internet than it is like the PC era. That's what I'm well, saying. Well, let me ask you a question. What's the difference yeah. between a sustainable enablement and a disruptive enablement? We'll just quote, the, we'll do some Clay Critchison here. I, I, I Innovator's that's dilemma. A, that's, a good, that's a good, really good point to bring you know up. The I difference think a sustainable, a sustainable um, enabler, uh, and, and enabler the word enabler, is, you're enabling so something the, the, of value. The, inter the internet is a sustainable enabler, and I think AI is going to be a sustainable enabler. Do you agree? No, I think it's going to be a disruptive enabler, which is why you see in those markets where there's disruption, like the PC or even the internet, although it was net new, the functionality is defined by, it's, it's embryonic, it's early and it's not adequate. People complain about it's not good enough, dial up slow, you know, and, and, and disrupt something. Like for example, the, and um, um, let's take the uh, Cisco example, the TCP IP, that revolution that was enabled by the P microprocessor and then ultimately that, that standards body of PCs and whatnot, the LANs, local area networks, wide area networks. TCP IP and Cisco was a disruptive enabler because TCP enabled more people to get in the game and took out the two big players, IBM, which had systems network architecture or SNA and DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, which had DECnet. These were proprietary network operating systems that were ruling corporate America and, and funding, powering companies like Ford. 
okay, complex proprietary protocols. Sun Microsystems had a server that was proprietary, sold to companies, they were disrupted by open standards. So disruptive means someone gets out. Sustain means the big guys just sustain that going. And, and in the past, it's been hard for both to have both at them at the same time. So some, it has to tip one way or the other. Does it, let, does it lead by sustainable or does it lead by disruption? Or is it equal? And that's going to be something that's unknown. It's okay. Unknown. It's unknown that's, to me, at least. Good. That's what I want. That's good. We just had, John, we just had a whole nother podcast. So I would say this. You would, I think you'd agree that the PC, the microprocessor-based revolution, was a, a disruptive technology. Yes. The internet was more of a sustaining technology. And I'm arguing that AI is going to be, to maybe I'm making your point, for the first time in history, will be both. I think, I think the internet was a disruptive technology because IBM and HP and Sun and those guys didn't take advantage of the value. They rode the wave, they came on later. I think you missed it. They came I on later. No, I think well, you're missing it. What contribution yeah. did those IBM, guys have to the internet? I, I, IBM. They didn't build the browser. They no, didn't but build. IBM, it, but it, it didn't disrupt them. IBM gave they had e -commerce. its monopoly. Remember, remember the ad IBM, sign at commerce? Yeah but, uh, yeah, yeah, but IBM gave its monopoly to Microsoft and, and unwittingly to Microsoft. <laughs> Dave, we're going to have to save right. this for a rants podcast. We can just do together <laughs> and debate the history of That's what's good. disruptive. To me, at the end of the we day, the scoreboard comes down to value creation, who captures that value, the big guys or the little guys. And I think, in my view right now, as I'm seeing the big guys, if they, if they don't, if the market can't let startups come in and, and rule, then it's not disruptive. So, yeah, well, nobody went out of business because of the internet. I mean, some companies did, but I'm saying the technology business, Sun didn't go out of business, they didn't go out of business, but they didn't get acquired because of the internet, right? I mean, it was just- The it, internet killed old functionality like going to the library, because I can look it up in a browser. Like I don't need to go to the library to, to research something. Okay, that's how well, you- Well, again, are we yeah. talking about the broader industry or are we talking about the technology industry? It's just in general, in technology has an enablement, enablement has impact. And that impact either well, has value and that gets captured by somebody or not, right? So if the browser can, can give a value to a user, that's captured by Netscape. In this yeah, case, they yeah. died, but Microsoft killed them because they had a monopoly. So where I'm getting confused in this conversation is we, we're jumping from the narrow you know, tech industry, which I yeah. think is hard to narrow down in the, in 2000 and you know this this day and age. Not narrow, Google, I'm talking about, we're talking about Google, Microsoft and Amazon. They're not, it's not narrow, That's those are big players. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think any one of those three companies is going to get disrupted by AI. I think they're going to take advantage of AI. But yet at the same time, I think there's going to be another player that comes out of the woodworks that I do too. 20 years from now is 20 years from now is going to be the next Amazon, Google, or Microsoft. Yeah, and exactly. And, and I think, and the question is, yeah. that's, I don't think that's, we're going to debate this another time, but we'll leave it. That, that's never really happened before. That I agree with, that both have occurred. Extracting I agree the rents and the, of the value extraction. We just took be, 20 minutes to agree. We argued, then we finally agreed. No, you argued. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, Dave, episode 15, if you're listening, give us feedback, DM us, go to siliconangle.com. That's where all the videos are. We broadcast there, the stories are there. That's where all the, the users and traffic is. Thecube.net, that's where the video library is. That's where we can find out where the cube's going to be and get replays uh, and, and check us out online. Um, we'll be back next week. And we're going to continue this conversation, Dave. We'll carry forward the rants and the analysis, and a lot going on. AWS reinforced big security conference. We got um, some big announcements going on in the city. There's over 44 different events happening in San Francisco next week for AI. Just goes to show you, we, there's so much action. And then we got Databricks coming up this month, HPE Discover, and we're going to be on the road. I'm home for two, four days this month, Dave. So we'll see you, out, we'll see you in uh, SoCal next yeah, week. Yeah, we'll see you down in uh, Southern California. I mean, then, right. then I'm going to head up to, to Palo Alto with you. All right, see you next time. All right, see you. Thanks, guys.